to all of you. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. God bless you. Great to have you in service this morning. I hope the kids have called, the grandkids have called, the great grandkids have called, your husband's taking you out or a friend's taking you out for brunch or a great lunch or dinner or whatever. But most of all, I pray today that you being here in church, you will experience the power and the presence of the Lord with you, ministering to you in whatever way that you need ministry this morning, because that's his way of doing things. He meets us individually and ministers to us in an individual way. So let's stand together and pray, and then we'll sing our song and we'll... Lord Jesus, I just thank you for the privilege of being here this morning to see each one of these wonderful people, especially the mothers today, a special day for them, and I pray that in a special way you would bless them and let them know that all of the things that they have done in raising their children and watching their children raise their children and maybe even great-grandchildren, that you will let them know that their job is not done. Prayer is the most important thing that we can do for our kids and our grandkids. And so I pray, Lord, that as a result of our being here today, we will have felt the presence of met with you, met with each other, and had wonderful, wonderful fellowship. Thank you, Jesus, for this special day. Thank you that we have the privilege of spending it here in this service this morning. And I pray now that you would bless each part of this service, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. Let's sing together. I'm so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Now turn and greet the people who are around you, especially welcoming and wishing the mothers a happy Mother's Day. been a journey here. I can tell you, well, yeah, especially the last four months with our pastor out. You know, he's just, I don't know if he's coming back. He's just been so sick. So, extra burden, but that's okay. It's a new every day. Exactly. It's new every morning. Yeah. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 is the essence of what my mother taught me as a young girl. I'd like to sing that. The steadfast love, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New every morning, great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, great is thy faithfulness. She taught me to go to the Lord every day in a devotional time, read God's word, <clears throat> pray, and his mercies would be new every morning. And his, his love for us never ceases. These are just wonderful things that I've learned um, from my mom. And uh, as a person now today, being so grateful to the Lord for my Christian heritage, my great-grandmother was a woman of God, and my grandmother, 
my memories of my grandmother were um, in the kitchen, of course, baking something, bread or pies, or putting a roast in the oven, but always with tears streaming down her face, praying for her family, praising God. These are, I have more memories of her doing that than I have any other kind of memory of my grandmother. I think the salt in her tears did something for that bread. Don't you put, I don't know what yeast needs to grow, but anyway, it was those salty tears. <laughs> well, pastry needs salt too. So then there was my mother who was committed and a godly woman to this day. And I'm so grateful to her for this teaching on um, going to the Lord, praying for our needs. At nine or 10 years old, I had a uh, love-hate relationship with a friend at church, a, a Christian girl <laughs> my age. We just would get into it. Her name was Trigvi. Now, how's that for a name? Trigvi. I have memories of Trigvi. And my mom would, I'd go to her and we'd have, Trigvi and I would be having problems. And my mom would tell me to pray about it. Well, I was really mad about that. I didn't want to pray about it. I wanted her to take my side and to tell me how to handle Trigby. But no, I'm supposed to pray about it. So I learned early that I take these things and these petitions to the Lord, as well as the praises to the Lord. Um, lately, the last two or three months, the focus of my mom's attention and conversation has been thanksgiving and gratitude to the Lord. Um, every chance <clears throat> we get, every time we sit down and talk, <clears throat> she is telling me how grateful she is for how the Lord has worked in her life. And she has not had an easy life. And she's so happy that she lives in the lower level of my sister's home because she can sing down there to the top of her lungs and praise the Lord and not bother anybody. And I think top of her lungs, my mom is about 85 pounds and has a squeaky little voice now. <laughs> Very musical in her day. And sometimes we hear her upstairs, so she can get some volume, but she just loves that freedom of praising the Lord every single morning. And this will be my memory of her listening and hearing her praise and honor God in that way. She keeps a list of songs by her Bible. <clears throat> and because, you know, the memory these days isn't so great, so she doesn't remember her favorite praise songs. So she has this list in it. It was great for my sister and I to read through that read through her little notebook of notations and things, but one of her favorite songs is, In the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Peace, troubles vanish, hearts are mended, in the presence of the King. I will remember and have that memory of her singing, singing those sound, songs. One of the notes or scriptures that she had written <clears throat> was 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Pastor spoke on that several months back, that chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is God's will. Have you thought about it that way? It's God's will that we give thanks in all circumstances. We don't have, we shouldn't be having a choice about that. It should just be a natural thing. If we let thankfulness to God become a way of life, <clears throat> there won't be any room for grumbling and complaining. So says my mother, Jessie Mercer. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction.
Oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> we, we, we know that some of you are anxious to get out of here, but uh, hang tight. We've got about 47 minutes to go. Uh, no, I asked Karen to share, and her mother is a godly, godly woman, and how wonderful that Karen's had the privilege of being able to be with her these last few weeks and uh, during her recovery. It's time for you to sing. Would you take your bulletin, please? We're singing songs about the love of Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be. Showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. And oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Such love, such wondrous love, such love, such wondrous love that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this that God should love a sinner such as I should yearn to change my sorrow into bliss the rest till he had planned to bring me nigh how wonderful is love like this such love 
such wondrous love, such love, such wondrous love, that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this? Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Jesus to Calvary did go. His love for sinners to show. What he did there brought hope from despair. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. I will be reading from Proverbs, Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 31. Who can find a virtuous woman and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her, and she will bring good, not harm, all the days of bring him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She's like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn and prepares breakfast for her household and plans the day's work for her servant girls. She goes to inspect a field and buys it. With her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She is energetic and strong and a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting the fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates where he sits with the other civic leaders and she makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the Burfants. May God add his Blessing to the reading of his word today. Let's be together in, uh, in prayer this morning. Lord, we are very much aware of the writers of the Psalms uh, so long ago, and we, uh, we pray to you and uh, with them this morning. Uh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. O oh God, you are our God, and we earnestly seek you this morning. Because you love us better than life, our lips glorify and praise your holy name. Satisfy us this morning, Lord, with the unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all the days of our life. Lord Jesus, we... Um, acknowledged to you this morning how your redemptive story uh, accounts for the violence that was spawned by fallen nature of man and we we acknowledge to you 
that we live in times of uncertainty and, and in violence these days. And Lord, the, the scope of destruction of adults, of children, of unborn babies is unparalleled in the history of the world and certainly in our world of seven billion people today. The weapons of war that we, we have are almost unthinkable. Lord, uh, mess is happening everywhere we turn and look. But this, we remind you and share with you this morning, is still the day that the Lord hath made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. You remain comforted uh, as you touch our hearts. Uh, we in you remain at peace this morning because we have your promise, your word, the very word from you, God, that the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. And this morning, Lord, we want to celebrate Mother's Day. Uh, Lord Jesus, we, we are reminded this morning that, uh, that as you celebrate uh, this Mother's Day in the heavens, honoring Mary, your mother, uh, we celebrate and honor mothers here on earth uh, at Friendship Church this morning who've, who've had the awesome privilege of partnering and, uh, and relating uh, with you in the celebration of new life. Uh, as they have undergone, and I might add, Lord, that um, we pray that uh, those fathers might fully understand uh, more dearly what uh, the labor that they've gone through and the service that they have brought in serving you during those times. We pray that they would grant these mothers the ability to understand the full meaning of that enormous blessing. Lord, you, you said it best in Carol's uh, passage this morning when she read from Proverbs 31. Many women do noble things, but motherhood surpasses it all. You said that charm is deceitful and beauty is fleeting, but women who show reverential trust in the Lord will one day be given the reward that she has earned and that all of her works will bring praise at the city gates. Mothers, this is your rich heritage. This is a part of your legacy that God has promised you for all eternity. We love you and we honor you and we lift you up for a special anointing for the Lord Jesus and a blessing on you from him this morning. We celebrate Mother's Day with you this morning. And Lord, this morning, uh, there are people here in our church family and our fellowship that are undergoing difficulties and hardships, those that are hurting, those that are discouraged, those that are lonely. We pray that uh, you would unleash your spirit and touch them this morning, anoint them with your spirit and, <clears throat> and heal and encourage them, we pray. Help us to be Christ together with them. <clears throat> and Lord, we... We would also ask for a special anointing this morning on HB as he continues to gain strength and then uh, and, and new mobility that you would restore that and that, that he would soon return and serve you here in uh, this great church. And Lord, we pray this morning for Jim and uh, all of his responsibilities that he have as that you would enable and anoint uh, he and Karen for their ministry to us. Pray especially for Karen as she uh, is concerned that you would uh, touch her mom this morning in Colorado and cause her to uh, feel your presence and know of our love for her as she is undergoing her difficulties this morning. And we would also want to lift up and pray uh, for our elders here at Friendship Church. We would pray, Lord, that you would anoint their leadership, uh, their planning, uh, their direction for our church, and help them to be of one mind and of one heart as they lead us in the affairs of the church for where you would have us be and go these days. Now, Lord, it's uh, as we close our, our time together in prayer, we would pray together the prayer that you gave us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to ask the ushers to come, if they would, at this time to wait on us for our morning tithes and offerings. Thank you again for your faithfulness. God bless you today as you give. From whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above ye heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You may be seated. I'd like you to give a warm welcome this morning to a special guest, Carol German. I'm going to miss that again. Her name is like mine. Germanson is coming as she lives in, in Shadow Hills, been in public education, has sung a lot around this community as well as other places. Give her a great big Friendship Church welcome this morning. Good morning and happy Mother's Day to you. And I just want to tell you that I'm so thankful for Marlis and Dallas Cote and Pastor Jim and our Heavenly Father for letting me come and share a song with you, even though it's not going to be the song in your bulletin. Because a couple of days ago, I got a special request, and that's very important to me. So I am doing a different song. Um, as believers, <clears throat> we live every single day with the warmth and the love and the promise of the resurrection in our lives and hearts. And Jesus said when he left that he was going to send his spirit, the helper and the comforter, to be with us. And he said, I'm not going to give you a spirit of fear, but I'm giving you a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. That spirit has incredible power, power that we can't even understand, the power over all things. And it dwells within us. And when we couple that power with our faith, amazing things happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like being able to sing it this early in the morning. <laughs> um, about 18 years ago, I came home from the doctor's office with a diagnosis of cancer. And when I went to bed that night, I opened my Bible on my nightstand. And I got a message in red letters, so I could not miss it. And it said daughter, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And it doesn't have to be a big thing like that. It's every day with everything 
the power of God Almighty dwells within us. And when we put our faith in that, he does things for us that are exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. I believe in faithfulness and I believe in giving of myself to someone else. I believe in peace and love and I believe in honesty and trust, but that is not All that I believe may never change the way it is until I believe Jesus lives. Where there is faith, there is a voice calling, keep walking. You're not alone in this world. Where there
I use a music stand because I'm more comfortable with that than a pulpit, so uh, that's why I'm down here. Plus, I like to be closer to you. Something about that being closeness is, is good. Um, my sermon uh, title today is Once a Mother, Always a Mother, and it came many, many years ago, maybe as many as 40 years ago. Um, I was at a church in Tualatin, Oregon, and on a Mother's Day, the pastor wasn't going to be there, and so he asked if I could cover for him that day. I said, well, of course, no problem. So as would happen, I picked up a cold that week. So when I called my mom to tell her that I was preaching and everything, she says, what's wrong with you? I said, what do you mean, what's wrong? I can tell something in your voice is wrong. So what's wrong? I said, well, I have kind of a cold. Well, if you would now do this, if you take the Vicks and put the Vicks here and do this and do that and do that and that. You know, here, here I am almost, you know, 35 years old. She's in her 70s. She's still wanting to mother me. So once a mother, always a mother. And, and I'm noticing a lot of you are shaking your heads too. You probably give your kids advice every time they, they call you unsolicited advice. In fact, the last, when Karen and I went to, to see Brent and Azumi and our new grandson a, a couple of months ago, we're sitting on the plane and I'm saying, now Karen, this time we're not going to, we're going to let them be the parents and we're going to let them do the planning and we're going to just sit back and coast. Oh boy, do you know how tough that is? Because they don't coast the same way we coast at all, you know. Grade school was a fun time because it was creative time and, and, and the art projects around uh, the month of, of April into May was doing the special card for mother for Mother's Day, you know, or making that special thing. My mom kept everything we made and then when, when we cleaned out our house, I, I, found, I found the polar bear I made in kindergarten for Mother's Day. I'm looking at that hunk of clay and saying, that's a polar bear? Well, in kindergarten, it was a polar bear. Then it came to writing cards, and you wrote these beautiful cards, and you brought them home, and oh, that was a treasure for mom. Now, you know, we get older, the, the gifts don't get quite as personal. It's what Hallmark has, or what Seas Candy has, or Pro Flowers, or, or Sherry's Berries, or whatever, you know, and hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully you'll go out your front door, probably around Mother's Day, you, sh you need to go out your front door every day to see if, the, if they've delivered something. Because here in the desert, the flowers that come, they leave on the front porch, you're not home, by the time you open them, they're wilted and dead, you know, because of the heat. But Mother's Day is just a special time for all of us. We, we moved from Minnesota to, to Seattle when I was five years old. Um, we could call our grandmothers two times a year on their birthday, and on Mother's Day. And there were five of us, and we could each speak about 35 seconds each because I think it was $400 for two minutes or whatever it was. But my dad said it was expensive. So, you know, it was, hi, Grandma, I love you. Happy Mother's Day, happy birthday, bang. And the next one would say the same thing. So we had the script all written out. But um, one mother summed it up this way about, about, and I think this is so, so really good. It says, every year my children ask me the same question. After thinking about it, I decided I'd give them my real answer. The question was, what do you want for Mother's Day? I want you. I want you to keep coming around. I want you to bring your kids around. I want you to ask me questions. Ask my advice. Tell me your problems. Ask for my opinions. Ask for my help. I want you to come over and rant about your problems. Rant about your life. Whatever I want you to tell me about your job, your worries, your kids, your pets. I want you to continue sharing your life with me. Come over and laugh with me, or laugh at me. I don't care. Just hearing your laughter is music to my ears. I spent the better part of my life raising you the best way I knew how. Now, give me time to sit and admire my work. Raid my refrigerator. Help yourself. I don't really mind. In fact, I wouldn't want it any other way. I want you to spend your money making a better life for you and your family. I have all the things I need. I want to see you happy and healthy. When you ask me what I want for Mother's Day, I say nothing, because you've already been giving me my gift all year long. I want you. Pretty much sums it up, doesn't it, for all of us. One lady was asked, uh, she was kind of a, a teacher, and, and she had this thing, and she said, you know, uh, this was, this was uh, when she was younger, no children. She, she, she said, I have three theories about raising children. After three children, she changed her thing, said, 
I have three children and no theories. <laughs> and, and it's like, you know what? Isn't that the truth? Karen and I used to teach a class on, on, on parenthood. We didn't have any kids. We were experts. <laughs> These people would sit in our class and they'd say, just wait till you have one. And boy, I'll tell you, it changes your life for sure. You have all, if you've been in church any uh, uh, two years or more, you've all heard the messages about all the women in the Bible. You've all read the message or heard the messages about the, the proverb that was read, the, the uh, Pro, Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman. My question, I don't know, men, if you've asked this or not. It talks about all of these things that the women are doing. I mean, from sunrise to sunset and even later. Now, are the guys sitting in their leather recliner with the remote? I mean, it says nothing about what the men are doing, but the women are busy from sunrise up to sunset doing all the things that they need to do to keep the family running together. So there are so many wonderful stories about mothers. There are so many wonderful things that we need to recognize. The stories never grow old. Just a couple of thoughts that I have in recognition of our mothers, which, again, you know, Moses got a commandment from God to say, honor your mother and your father. So part of today is honoring our mothers, whether they're alive or they've passed away, honoring their memories. They're so resourceful. A mother is a maker. She's a mender. She's a moderator. She's a teacher. She makes chocolate chip cookies and laws and sometimes order in her home. She makes small balloons out of the big balloon that popped. She makes peanut butter sandwiches, and peanut butter sandwiches, and peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> she makes peace in her home. She mends broken dishes, and she mends broken hearts. She mends hurt elbows and hurt feelings. She mends torn jackets and torn fingers. She's a moderator in her home in times of war, civil war civil unrest between the siblings, verbal war, insurrection, minor skirmishes, attacks on the enemy, in times of strife, in times of injustice, in times of temper, in times of pulling hair. She's a wonderful teacher. She teaches how to button buttons and tie shoelaces. She teaches how to hold a knife and a fork and how to say a prayer. She teaches how to hang up clothes and sit still in church. Boy, isn't that a challenge. I forgot. I'm, I'm, I'm on now. Hang on. There we go. Is that better? No, you can't. Um, she teaches us how to hang up our clothes. She teaches us how to love books and love music and even to turn a child's heart toward God. But one thing a mother can never teach is to teach a child when they come in the door, not to slam the door behind them. And the other thing she can't teach them is to take their muddy shoes off become, before they come into the kitchen where she had just washed the floor. Great responsibilities. A mother is expected to be superhuman when you think about it. She's expected to be everything to every child. She's to be a pediatrician, a physician, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. She's expected to be an expert in every field. The role of a mother is impossible to do without the help of God Almighty, without the prayer, without being able to take whatever's going on in your home to the Lord in prayer. We all have heard of the many famous women of the Bible. Jochebed, the mother of Moses, who in sacrificial love let Moses be raised by someone else. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, who dedicated him to the Lord and to the Lord's service, and the Lord used him mightily. And certainly Mary, who bore the Son of God to bring redemption and salvation to this world. Today, I'm going to just take you on a personal journey, if you don't mind. And you don't have much choice, but I hope you don't mind. Because on Mother's Day, I thought as I was praying about this, of some women in my life who were a great influence and a great, had great impact on my life. The first one was my grandmother. I had two grandmothers, of course. 
But my one grandmother was my favorite because she had six grandchildren and the other one had 16. And the one that had six was my dad's mother and I was the youngest and she liked me the most. So I really loved her. That was the kind of house you could go into. You, you didn't have to ask permission to open a drawer to get something out of the refrigerator. You were just at home at grandma's house. She loved having us there. When, when I was a small kid, we lived right across the driveway from each other. I think I spent more time in her house than I did in our house. She just made that atmosphere so pleasant and so wonderful to be with. She had a very hard life, was widowed uh, at a very young age. My dad was the oldest of three kids. He was eight years old. My grandmother never remarried, but she worked very, very hard in manual labor just to be able to supply what the kids needed. But that hardship never left her bitter. It left her stronger because she chose to do that. She loved the Lord and was constantly whistling. Like Karen's grandma was always singing and her mother singing. My grandma always whistled, no matter what she was doing, whether she was cooking or cleaning, doing the laundry. In fact, if I just stop right now, I can hear her whistling the old, old hymn called Whispering Hope. She would, thank goodness she knew more than that song because that would have driven you insane if that's the only one. But she had a, a, whole, a whole repertoire of songs that she would just whistle through the day. I lived with her and my uncle during the summer of my, my, senior, uh, my uh, freshman year of college, I was in Springfield, Missouri. They were in Wisconsin. But in February of that year, her, her, her daughter, my aunt, was killed in an auto accident by a drunk driver. And as soon as I got the word, I made my way up to Wisconsin to spend time with her and walk through those dark days with her and watched her grieve, watched her cry, but also listened to her talk about the hope that we have in Christ Jesus and eternity when it's our time to go. Six years later, I was now a, a, in, the, in the ministry, had graduated, had, was in this church in, in uh, Fresno, California, and um, my grandma passed away, and my, my dad asked me if I would do her service. So I, I did my grandma's service, and at the gravesite, it was a cold February winter snowy day in Minnesota. Oh, it was freezing cold. And got through the service, did the committal, everyone left, and I'm standing there beside the grave of my grandma just by myself, and I started to cry for my loss. And her words came back to me of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, and that she wasn't there, she was with her Lord. The second one is my mom. My mom was a very shy person, and I took after her, uh, really, and, you know, I just followed her example tremendously. Yeah, well, she, she never figured out. She thinks I was adopted. I don't know what it was, but it didn't come from the same one. So she wasn't very social. She had very small group of friends. Where she was most comfortable was in her home. She loved when it was just the five of us sitting around the table. She loved when she heard the commotion of the kids, the, my sisters and I have two older sisters. Um, you know, she enjoyed that. She didn't like when we were running around the dining room table trying not to catch each other, you know, kind of thing. She wasn't happy with that. But she just enjoyed doing that kind of thing. She, she grew up on a, on a farm in Minnesota with, six, with five other siblings, met my dad in a church in Minnesota. She was the piano player. In fact, my mom started playing the piano when she was 13 years old in a Baptist church. On her 80th birthday, she retired uh, playing either the piano or organ in a church for 67 years. So she loved the Lord, brought us to church, you know, from the time we were born uh, until we left home. She was a stay-at-home mom. She loved that. She just loved getting the house ready for us. She loved making dinner. She loved all of the things that had to do with, with getting everything together and making sure we were all put together. She liked this. She liked even when we were... were sick and had to stay home from school. She, liked, she was no problem, you know. I, I remember one time taking the thermometer and putting on a lamp next to my bed to make it go a little higher so I could stay home. Now the rule at home was you could only be out two days because on the third day of missing, then you had to have a written note from your mother to come back to school. She would not do that. So sick, two days out, three days you're back at school, you know. So she just, she just loved that. She really, really was unhappy when my older sister moved out, and then my middle sister moved out. I graduated from high school and went, I don't know how many miles, from Seattle down to Springfield, Missouri, 
and now mom and dad were alone and life had changed for her. What was fun though was to see the grandkids start coming and see her light and her life brighten up again as she had more things to do, more clothes to make, more food to cook, more, more family gatherings to have. Many, many times we as a family would get together and mom at, you know, the mid 70s to 80s, it was just so much fun to see her get down on the floor, play with the kids, laugh, and just have a great time. That was mom at her best. When I went away to college, 1965, needless to say, the $400 phone calls were still there, so mom was a faithful letter writer. Wrote me a letter every single week, and I wish I had kept them, but I didn't. But one of the things she signed off on every single letter was, stay humble. I've never forgotten that and hope that I've heeded her advice. 1967 was a turning point in my life. I had a blind date with a beautiful blonde from another school. We dated occasionally and then finally began to be more serious with each, with each other and in the fall of 1968. <laughs> well, you know, that's ancient history. How are you in history? No, uh, in 1968, Karen and I believed that it was God's will for us to be married, and uh, we, we were engaged. However, she had been in Sacramento. She graduated a year before I did, so I was in Springfield. She was in Sacramento teaching but we got engaged at Christmas time and then got married the following year. She, as you can tell, is my steady, solid rock of Gibraltar. She's the love of my life. She's my anchor. She's my partner. She's my companion. She's my friend. God could not have given me a better balanced person than my wife, Karen. When I'm down, she's right there to give me the kick that I need to realize that it's not as bad as I think it is. And I hope I'm the same for her when she's down. That to me is a perfect, perfect balance. She's so committed to the Lord and so committed to the direction that the Lord has for our lives. We've moved five different major times from one church to another church as, as that itinerary kind of goes. Each time, no complaints. She's packed up everything, kissed her friends goodbye. We've moved to a new area, made new friends, and she's created a home that has become our sanctuary every place we've gone. She's been a faithful, true partner in life and in ministry as well. The last woman I'd like to tell you about is a young lady who was 28 years old, a single mother of a five-year-old son. She was living with a guy and um, found out she was pregnant. She had a five-year-old, now she's pregnant. So she goes to him and says, guess what? I'm pregnant. To which his response was, here's what you do. Stay with me, abort the baby, keep the baby, move out. She moved out to an apartment that was just across the street from a church. She and her little boy started attending the church on a regular basis and realizing as her pregnancy was progressing that at a minimum wage worker that she was, she could not afford to raise two children. So she approached the pastor and said, could you help me find a couple who would be willing to adopt my unborn baby? So the pastor comes to this, he says yes he would help, and he came to this young couple who weren't able to have children and, and, and told him the circumstances and said, now you take 30 days and you pray about this and you figure out does God really want you to have a child? And if you do, come back and we'll, we'll talk about it. Thirty days later, after much prayer, much conversation, much decision-making, the young couple came back to the pastor and said, yes, we, we believe God wants us to have this child. The inter the, 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 this was now in August. The child was to be born in February, or January. So all of that time, this couple is thinking and planning and dreaming and all of the wonderful things of preparation to bring a child into their life. Finally, the phone call came that the little boy had been born, and bango, they're in their car and heading right to the hospital. Picked up that child and looked at every single nuance, every breath that child took, every smile, anything, you know, seeing the finger, all of that, just wonderful, wonderful time 
of bonding with this little baby until the nurse in the, in the nursery came and said, uh, the birth mother would like to see the baby, so you all need to leave. Hearts in their throat, they walked out the door, began crying, thinking she's changing her mind. What in the world? We believe this was what God had, and now we're told the birth mother wants to see him. Prayers, calls to parents, holding each other's hands. This young couple just said, God, how could you do this, bring us to this point, and then snatch this baby away? So finally they were summoned back into the nursery. They go in, and the birth mother's gone. The nurse says, yes, she was here. Well, well, what, what did she say? All she wanted to do was check and make sure this baby was perfect, that he had 10 fingers and 10 toes and two ears and a nose and, you know, was just a healthy little baby. She said, I just want this gift to this young couple to be perfect. Jeremiah 29, as we well know, says, for the, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And that perfect little gift, that sacrificial gift from this birth mother in 1981 is the reason that Karen has been able to celebrate Mother's Day for the last 36 years. A gift because someone chose life allowed us to be parents and now to be grandparents. <laughs> We FaceTimed yesterday. If we had all afternoon, and every one of you had a chance to come up here, you all have a story to tell. You all have had experiences in your life. Some are good stories. Some of you have wonderful stories about your mother, or wonderful stories about being your mother, or being a mother. Some of you may not have those good stories. Maybe childhood was not good. Maybe you were in foster homes. Maybe you were abandoned. Maybe all of those things. I'm here to tell you this morning one thing. That our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is here to heal the brokenhearted. To mend the fractured wounds. To put salve on the bad memories. So that you, on this Mother's Day, can celebrate His love. That's the most important, his love. And those of us who were blessed to have mothers who loved Jesus Christ and loved us, we can rejoice in the memories. Those of you whose mothers are still living, you can rejoice in the fact she's still here. And you can, I encourage Karen every time she needs to go back to Colorado, go. Because you can still go to your mother. I can't go to mine anymore. She's not here. So on this Mother's Day, whatever your story is, Thank the Lord for it, because you are the person you are today because of what you've been through. And God will bless you as you honor him and you honor your mother and your father. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, today I am so grateful for the fact that we were able to come to church today to worship and to celebrate you, but also to celebrate our mothers and I pray that whatever the memory might be, that if it's a good memory, you would just reinforce it in our hearts. You would help us to be better parents to our kids and to our grandkids. Help them to see the love of Jesus Christ flow through us as we have seen through our parents. And for those who haven't had that great experience, I pray, Lord, that you would just fill them with your love and your hope and let them know that because of you, they are who they are today, walking in faith, believing in you. Thank you so much for this day. Thank you for each mother. I pray a special blessing now on each one as we leave this place, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. And everyone said, amen. For all of